Hey, good afternoon, people. It is uh, Tuesday in April, the last Tuesday in April, and it's our last chance to get together to talk about orcas, also known as killer whales. <laughs> and today, uh, I'm, again, I'm Rod Lucier, uh, and with me is Natalie Lucier, the, the uh, filmmaker who we've been working with the last few weeks. To the Orcas with Love is her film, and she's brought along a special guest for us today. So I'm going to let Natalie introduce our guest. Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here again and I'm very excited to have Finn. Finn Onans, is it, am I saying your last name correctly, Finn Onans, Finn Onans? Yes, Onans, okay. yes. Onans. So Finn <laughs> Onans is joining us and I was with Finn when I was at Orca Lab in the summer of 2012 and that was a very amazing experience and I know Finn you have so much um, experiencing researching whales and marine life. Um, just wondering if we could ask you just a few questions about your work experience and your life that you've sort of been dedicated to all of this. Um, if you'd like yeah, to share sort of, absolutely. yeah, some of the work that you've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. So are you going to ask me questions or do you want me to just kind of... Okay, so maybe I'll, okay, so maybe I'll ask you, so what got you interested in, be, in getting into researching marine life? Okay, so I am originally from the UK and I'm from a landlocked city. And so every opportunity as a little kid, I was trying to get to the coast as much as possible, whether it was surfing, whether it was going, uh, playing around in the tide pools. Um, I was just obsessed with uh, the ocean. And fortunately, my parents were very obliging and took me um, to the ocean quite a bit. Um, so. The UK is small, right? So I'm, you're only ever like an hour and a half from the ocean. So even though I was from a landlocked city, I was kind of semi-close to the ocean. Um, and I remember when I was little, just kind of being so like enchanted by it. And just that whole idea that there's a whole nother world that you just can't see. Um, so much is going on that is just unknown. Um, and that really fueled kind of my interest. Um, in the marine stuff. Um, specifically, uh, marine mammals came a little bit later, um, but uh, I guess it was still kind of in the same idea. I was um, in south, uh, southwest England in a little uh, county called Como, and that's kind of where I used to go surfing. And I was on the headland with my dad, and I saw a pod of dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, uh, swim past, and wow. um, I just was, that's what I wanted to study. Um, and so I did everything I could to, to make it happen. Amazing. Um, and what is your favorite whale or, or marine animal? <laughs> well, I mean, the orc is pretty up there. Yeah, no, as a, <laughs> as a little kid, I it was always, you know, that whole iconic black and white orca. It's, you know, probably the easiest one to identify and, um, yeah, I just love how family oriented they are, how social, how, you know, I love listening to their sounds. Um, I've also done a little bit of research with humpback whales. Um, and I think that those are really exciting to watch. Um, and they are, can be uh, very acrobatic. They all have like, you know, very distinct personalities. Um, and um, so I would say those would be my, my second favorite. So um, could, could, yeah. like I'm, I'm interested Amazing. to know how you take an interest like that, how you end up so fortunate to be able to pursue that interest and end up at Orca Lab, for example, as a start. Is that where you started first studying those mammals? So uh, no. So I actually um, ended up at a tiny liberal arts school um, in uh, Maine, um, in Bar Harbor, Maine. And the school's only 300 students. It's called College of the Atlantic. And there they had a pretty much a liberal arts uh, style degree, but you got to piece together, you know, how you wanted to go, go about it. And um, I took a strong interest in marine science. Um, and I was working with professors there. Um, and they also had, um, they were the first ones, um, so I should say, at College Atlantic, there's uh, a marine mammal organization there called Allied Whale, um, and they were early pioneers in photo ID of humpback whales. Um, so I was then working part-time um, as a research assistant for Allied Whale, 
Um, and then as an undergrad, um, I had all these marine classes um, and part of my degree was doing some kind of internship. And there weren't many rules about what the internship had to involve. It just had to be 10 weeks long. And I had um, read and dreamt about British Columbia and I'd heard of Paul Spong and Orca Lab. And um, I just ended up there and yeah. Um, had an amazing summer and saw tons of marine life and made some really great connections through it. And where's that led to you now? What type of work are you doing these days? So, yeah, so um, after I graduated, I then went back to the UK um, and I uh, did a master's um, in marine mammal science and I actually focused it on bioacoustics. So I used a lot of um, um, recordings from the Northern residents uh, as part of my, my thesis, um, which was great. But I quickly realized that acoustics wasn't quite for me. I liked listening to it, but the whole physics and maths and all these kind of, you know, laws of sound, it was just a little bit much. So um, after that, I um, moved to the U.S. Um, with my now wife. Um, and I've been working in Washington, D.C. Um, as a contractor for NOAA Fisheries, so working for the government. Um, and so I work in the Office of Protective Resources um, as a contractor there, and I'm kind of partially responsible for uh, their stranding uh, response program um, and kind of keeping tabs on what's happening around uh, the U.S. Uh, in terms of strandings um, and also unusual mortality events. So when there is um, like a lot of unusual strandings that are happening all at once, there's an investigation that begins and kind of like as to why these things are happening. So I'm part of that team as well that uh, explores, um, you know, why these things are going on. And that's more a transboundary, like we do a lot of work with uh, British Columbia on the west coast and then on the east coast with Nova Scotia, um, just because of the migration of some of the, some of the species. Um, so that's what I, I do currently. Yeah. That's really Amazing. interesting. I bet there are a lot of stories about that. We should spend a little bit of time um, talking about orcas in particular, because I know you, the two of you have that in common. Um, but I, before we go there, I just want to ask if you could maybe tell me what is there anything we know about these animals that are just deciding on mass to go to a place where they're going to perish? Um, I mean, it, it's different for different. Uh, so right now in the United States, there's a lot of um, unusual mortality events declared, and they're very different reasons depending on which coast which part of the u.s that you're in it's a very u.s centric program initially but with a little bit of collaboration with canada um but you know things from we're seeing um some very skinny gray whales in kind of the the west coast of the, of the states in canada so that could be you know uh changing in prey um it could be a lot of could be a lot of things that we just don't know about yet um, on the East Coast, there's a lot of stuff happening with right whales. The North Atlantic right whale, there's um, around about 410 or so of those left. And so uh, they are pretty susceptible to uh, ship strikes um, and entanglements. And so that has kind of initiated another uh, UME. Um, and then um, there's been one recently uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So a lot of bottlenose dolphins have kind of been washing up um, with these kind of funny kind of lesions. And although it's still early days, um, there's kind of evidence that these are from fresh water. So from these kind of heavy rain events and then also opening um, some of the, the levees down in Louisiana. So a lot of fresh water is going into the ocean and they can't kind of cope with the drop in salinity and so it's mm -hmm. giving them these big kind of like welts so um yeah so for different areas there's 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 unfortunately there's stuff going on all over the place so yeah yeah there's been, there's been a lot of changes with um sort of this 
the last two months, I guess, with the world slowing down and sort of not being sort of not doing a whole lot of stuff that damages the planet. Like normally there seems to be less transportation, less products being made, less things being polluting uh, waterways, less shipping. Um, are you seeing any impacts that way in, in just this short term and, and how wildlife are being affected? Maybe, I don't know about the orcas in well, particular, but... Yeah, so right now is actually a pretty difficult time because a lot of our organizations aren't going out to respond because of the whole kind of stay at home orders and stuff. So it's a little bit of an unfortunate gap in our data that, you know, we do have the occasional report of, you know, uh, a, a dolphin being washed up, but then we can't really go to access it to kind of necropsy to find out why. Um, but, you know, they are still, um, even with all the stay at home stuff, uh, marine mammals are still kind of washing up. Um, you know, a lot of times it is natural. It just, you know, there is something that's not quite right in an animal comes to shore. Um, we also do a lot of work with seals as well. And obviously those are land-based, so it's less extreme when you see a seal out the water, but you know, there's, um, We've been seeing, you know, ice seals coming down pretty far south uh, in the U.S., wow. um, which is a little unusual when you find an ice seal in New York City um, and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, things, things are definitely changing. Ranges are expanding. Um, but as for the whole COVID piece, um, that will probably be a couple of months off really figuring out how that's impacted um mm -hmm. although i would imagine um a quieter ocean would probably be part of the the result of covid so you, you yes so natalie maybe you, you know about this too um but the sort of the interference of all the noise and traffic especially where you were working at orca lab and how that must have impacted those animals i'm, I'm just I'm curious to know with uh, the way they communicate, you having studied all the communication and, and, and sort of how families would have their own little languages, right? Uh, from pod to pod. But I'm, I'm curious to know how that, like, maybe no one's keeping an eye on it. I'm curious, I'm curious to know what's happening you in our backyard there with regard to those animals and how they're coping with it. Did you notice anything, Natalie, in your time there or Finn with, with, uh, with how they were reacting with all the activity in the neighborhood? I think Paul Spong was very concerned about like the ocean traffic, right? He was very and open with us about, you know, how that disturbs the orcas. Um, and I've, I've read a few different articles being written just recently about the quiet ocean fin. So I don't, I, you might have probably also heard this and that it's almost, you know, beneficial to the whales in some in, so, in that reason um, that it's less traffic out there. So I've just been reading articles, but I don't, yeah, I don't know how, how much that it's actually affected the whales, but just reading people writing about the quieter ocean. Yeah, there's a really um, interesting uh, paper, which I haven't read for a long time, um, but it was actually of after 9-11, um, everything was on lockdown and there was, um, a study, I can't remember who by, um, and they basically were out on the water at the time. And so they had the recordings before and during this lockdown. Um, and they also took a couple of um, samples, which wouldn't, you know, Paul Spong wouldn't like that they were biopsy samples, but they found out that in these periods of quiet, they actually had lower um, stress hormones. Okay. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so it just shows you kind of what, you know, this added stress that they're taking on. Um, and, you know, through some of the stuff that I learned at Orca Lab, um, and then also with my, my thesis, is, you know, these animals are having to communicate louder. They're having to communicate more frequently. They're having to wait for like a little gap in like a drop in the ocean noise. Um, because it's not just the, I mean, oceans are pretty noisy places anyway, from like shrimp, you can hear shrimp on the recordings, you can hear other marine mammals, but then on top of that, you have all this kind of vessel traffic, 
And you know, that, that route from Seattle to Alaska is one of the busiest channels up Johnstone Strait of anywhere, you know, in, in North America. It's so busy. The amount of, you know, logging vessels and they have ferries, they have cruise ships, they have pleasure boats, they have all sorts. And so it's just that whole kind of compounding um, of noise um, is, yeah, I can't imagine the stress, the stress levels, but um, yeah. Uh, Sarah's, Sarah's asking in the chat, she's interested in ways to connect school children's interests in this area and wondering um, about how these agencies might work together outside of just North America. Is there any international efforts where the organizations are working together and then maybe follow that with um, how, how, can, how can young people or teachers of young people find out more to track this kind of information? Yeah, I think there are um, different pockets around the world, different researchers that are working on um, ocean noise. Um, and I think, you know, like there's a lot of research happening around the UK uh, in terms of, you know, um, renewable energy and kind of offshore, you know, you're building a new wind farm and kind of the noise of the construction phase of kind of, you know, how much noise are we putting into the environment through projects like that. Um, and so I think there are examples um, from different places um, of people kind of studying um, ocean noise. Um, in terms of collaborations, I'm not too sure. I'm, I'm sure there are collaborations happening, um, but I always think you can always do more. Um, and so I think that would be um, something to really kind of push towards, especially as these oceans aren't going to get any quieter. If anything, they're just going to be increasing the amount of volume on uh, that we're putting into the ocean. Um, and I think really, you know, trying to inspire the next generation to take an interest, whether that is ocean acidification, whether it's salmon farming, whether that's kind of, you know, this human made noise, if it's, you know, microplastics, um, climate change, there's, there are so many ways uh, to engage kids. And there's a real need to engage kind of the next generation, because they're the ones that are going to have to kind of, you know, take it forward. Um, and so I think I would say, um, some of the best ways are just kind of spending time at the coast and just asking kind of the questions and, and just exploring. And I think through exploration, you then kind of, you go on tangents and then that leads to more exploration. And then I think from, and I think, you know, when you think how creative kids are and their minds and their imaginations, I think, you know, just getting them excited about about the seas and kind of the animals that live there. And I, I think Natalie's film and other film, there are other films that talk about similar issues, but all, all the things you talk about, ocean acidification and yeah. um, the, 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 you know, the plastics in the ocean, the, the, the salmon farming, all of that, it's a very complex story. And so you're specializing yeah. in one aspect of things right now with the NOAA and I'm, like there's just so many topics and I, I love the idea of, of just following the interests of young people, trying to point them to other things and resources and stories that sort of are enriching. And Natalie, you know that when you got started and your interest in all of this, where did you go for information and how did you end up? At um, like maybe that's, that's part of an example story. Yeah, I mean, for me, I wasn't necessarily studying them as a biologist or anything. I was just had a deep interest in the orcas and in the wildlife. So um, especially orcas. So I was just it was reading, you know, a book by Alexander Morton, other than the one that I read when I was a child, there was a newer one that came out. Um, and I can't think of the name of it right now. But listening to whales, I think it was. And in that book, she talked about Paul Spong, and she talked about Orca Lab. And then I just made me like research who were they, you know, where were they located? And then it was really just emailing them and calling them and asking questions. And, you know, and I didn't have the skills, um, research based skills, but I had the skills that I could use a camera and I was a film graduate. So I could, you know, use, and I really wanted to film the whales and make a documentary. So I used that strategy to get in there. Um, 
and it was amazing, you know, to have that opportunity. So I think it is, it, it's about having an interest in something and finding a way to get around, you know, learning more about it. Um, and in schools, there's so many different programs that you can take, like marine biology, and actually go out on whale boats where they're, you know, counting the whales and doing research. And, um, and you can actually get out there physically and, and be with the other researchers and learn from them and learn the ropes. So there is opportunity to go into those areas if that's what your interest is, for sure. Myself, I have a, I, I'm more of a, I guess I like Paul's song aspect of taking a step back and doing land-based research, not necessarily getting in a boat and chasing the whales, but yeah. being in an area where you know that they live and being able to see them in their natural habitat without being too invasive. I, I those, that sort of thought process and that the way that uh, Orca Lab sort of the values that they have, I agreed with. And that was another reason why I wanted to go with them. Um, but yeah, I just, I just think that when you do these things like Finn and like we stayed in touch through Facebook since leaving Orca Lab and now to see, you know, where he's gone with his stuff and then to see, oh, I made my movie now, <laughs> you know, Finn can watch it. Yeah. Like, it's like, <laughs> I think when you have that passion inside of you, you know, it becomes a part of your life. Like, you know, and, um, and now that my film's complete, we're still sharing it. We're still getting it out there. And I, every time I watch it in film, uh, Finn was just able to watch it as well. He said, you know, I felt like I was there. You brought me back to 2012, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and the Johnson Strait, like what an amazing place. And I think too, it's about going to these places and actually feeling them physically, you know, going to the coast, going to the ocean, seeing the whales. I think there's nothing stronger than that that's the you know being a part of their world can change you and it's hard to say just go there but you know what <laughs> i think yeah. we just need to go there well and if not there to a coast somewhere where to, in nature somewhere in nature uh let me ask this maybe as we sort of wind things down a little bit what would you say is the thing that that you found most fascinating about orcas in your time at orca lab that, that really surprised you and maybe changed you in some way interesting like for me one of the things that i was unaware of that i that i came to to really be in a little bit of awe of is this whole idea of the family structure about the matriarchal society that these animals are in for really for their entire lives that they stay so close and we're in this time now where we're in our homes a lot of us with our families living that way where people don't venture very far they're staying very close to home so we're almost like living the lives of the orca and i, I just uh to me that i found very fascinating but i'm curious to know what as people who have spent time out there what types of things really st stuck with you yeah i was really um amazed and am still amazed that how each kind of family unit has a very distinct uh, repertoire of sounds and you know if you're not from that family you don't make those sounds and so um they're very kind of individualized in that way and you know you know different families have similar sounds but you know they you can tell in some of the people that had been you know paul spong and helena simmons um they were able to tell like which family was going past Orca Lab without even seeing a dorsal fin. They were like, oh, that's so-and-so. And that just really amazes me, just A, how good some researchers really are at recognizing the sounds. And then also just the fact that, you know, they ha have this kind of set of tools that they they use for their whole life and they communicate and they they're almost constantly communicating with one another and even throughout the night they're there because i mean orca lab you had to wake up at all hours and you know start with the recording and you know it's it's just their the underwater soundscape um is just really fascinating and also I like how the whales use different um like the bathymetry to kind of enhance certain sounds or to try and, you know, they're, they're using the objects in the water to kind of like magnify some of their sounds or to, or to communicate over greater distances or um, that to me, the acoustic side um, was fascinating and still is, is fascinating to me. 
How about for you, Natalie? That reminds me of, for myself, being at CP in the hut and having the radio on and listening to, you know, the hydrophones all night long. So sometimes it'd be quiet because they weren't there, but then you could hear that they were coming and then they would get louder, <laughs> like, like almost falling, you know, we would always keep them on. So like I would sleep to the sounds of the whale, literally. Um, and then I, 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 you know, you miss that when you're not there, but now there's this opportunity too on their website where you can tune in um, and they have, you know, they have live video cameras now you can actually see the video of them um but i act there's something raw and real about missing being there where the whales are and just hearing them hearing their sounds even though you can't see them because it's underwater um and i still hear those sounds like it's something that just gets in you you know mm -hmm. and even my little son everest you know if you say ev ev say a whale say i say an orca sound and he he's out right now in our new garden <laughs> raking but if he was inside, he would do he would do orca sounds for you, and it sounds like an orca, you know. And I'm like Everest, I just, you know. And and other people be like, that doesn't sound like whale, but they don't really know what orcas sound like, with their little squeals and like little, like he just it's fascinating. So I have a little boy here who's just loves animals, loves making the sounds, loves trying to explore and all this. And he hasn't actually seen an orca yet in the wild, but one day he will. And even now he talks about, he's seen a, he's seen a humpback and cause I brought him to BC last year and I took him on a, a boat tour, but it was early in the season. It was May and the, the orcas weren't, the transients weren't around and the, the residents we didn't see. Um, but he remembers seeing this humpback whale and he says, mom, remember when we saw it? And he puts the arm up like this. It was doing this. <laughs> and I was like, Everett, it was doing that. Oh, there he is. Do you want to do an orca sound, Debbie? Do you want to do an orca sound? Can you do well? <laughs> he's being shy not at this time well, I know. I, um, i'm, I'm kind of envious because i would love to have the experience of just immersing myself in the natural environment for a long stretch of time and um, i have not yet spent other than in a gondola I, that's the only time i've ever been in british columbia was on a gondola that uh from sunshine village <laughs> going up the gondola ride to ski at the summit, there was a sign saying, welcome to, uh, to beautiful British Columbia. And then another 100 meters up, there's a sign that says, welcome back to sunny Alberta. <laughs> it's just like, it's not fair. I really would love to do it. But I want to take a moment to thank both of you for sharing your passion. And uh, our hope is that other young people that will see this or their teachers will see this and sort of be inspired to continue their own uh, investigations and curiosity and pursue what they're passionate about. It's, cure it's clear. Uh, that each of you has found a way to take your interest and turn it into a lifestyle and a way of living and being, uh, and you're passing that on to other people. So let me thank Finn, uh, Finn Onans, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States these days, but having been a, a, a sort of collaborator and worker at Orca Lab with Natalie Lucia here. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Finn, Thank for joining you. us. It was lovely to have you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for coming. And this was great. Yeah, so this recording will be then available um, at a later time for other people to be able to, to tune in. So thank you. Thanks again, Finn. Awesome. All right. Take care now. Thank you.